I'm ready, right? Order. Order. The Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs has started, and um, I, I call the meeting to order. Uh, I'm Rafa Di Costanzo, the MLA for Clayton Park West, and today we'll be hearing from the Royal Canadian Legion regarding the Poppy and Remembrance Program. Uh, please put on your phones on silent or vibrate. Has everybody done that? Please. I think I haven't, sorry. Just want to make sure I've done that. It is on, perfect. Um, in case of emergency, please exit through the back doors, uh, walk down the hill to Hollis Street and gather in the courtyard of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. We have new procedures in place to help protect the health of everyone here today. We're meeting in the legislative uh, chamber instead of our usual committee room. You are seated as far apart as possible, but please keep your mask on during the, the meeting unless you are speaking. We have provided bottled water. If you have a bottle at your desk, please keep the cap on um, while you're drinking. While you're not drinking, I apologize, this is, not, this is to protect the new microphones from, from spill. Please try not to leave your seat during the meeting. If you must, you must, of course, I suggest we all take a short break at, break, uh, at the one hour mark to allow, to allow for this break. Perhaps we could agree to extend the length of the meeting by 15 minutes until 4.15. Is everybody in agreement? Thank you. Um, now I will ask the committee members to introduce themselves, starting with the um, with Ms. Roberts. Hello and good afternoon and welcome to the legislature. I'm Lisa Roberts, the MLA for Halifax Needham. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kim Maslin and I am the MLA for Queen Shelburne. I'm Ben Jessam, and I represent Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Good afternoon. Tony Ince, uh, Cole Harbor, Portland Valley. Hi, I'm Margaret Miller, MLA for Hans East, and I have mask envy. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Murray Ryan, MLA for Northside Westmount. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Perfect. Um, and I welcome the witnesses as well. Sorry. Uh, we have Don McCumber, who is the Poppy and Remembrance Chair, uh, and Valerie Mitchell Vino, Executive Director. Uh, we will open it to questions and answers, and I will keep a list uh, of people who would like to speak uh, or ask questions. Um, remind everyone to wait. If you could wait for you to, uh, until I call your name so that the microphone will come on. And we will wrap the questions just before four so that we can uh, do our business meeting. Uh, business of the meeting and, all right. We can, uh, if you can start with your remarks, thank you. And I will see. Good afternoon. Sorry, I'm, I should call your name, I apologize, one second. Mr. McComber. On behalf of members of the Royal Canadian Legion, Nova Scotia Nunavik Command, I extend great thanks to the committee for your interest and support. We are most pleased to meet with you today. Every year from the last Friday of October to November the 11th, tens of millions of Canadians wear a poppy as a visual pledge to honour Canada's veterans and remember those who sacrificed for the freedoms we enjoy today. While the poppy is distributed freely to all who wish to wear one, the Legion gratefully accepts donations to the poppy fund. The poppy campaign is very much a local initiative conducted by Legion branches in cities, towns and communities across the country. The Poppy Campaign is organized and run by local Legion volunteers at over 1,400 branches across Canada and abroad, 102 of which are within Nova Scotia, 
Nunavut Command. Poppy funds are held in trust at every level of the Legion, and the use of these trust funds are strictly controlled via appropriate advance approval processes. Branch executives are accountable for poppy fund expenditures and are required to inform the public of the results of their campaigns, including contributions received and disposition of funds. Donations collected during the poppy campaign are held in trust to directly support veterans and their families and to help ensure Canadians never forget. Through donations to the Legion Poppy Fund, the Legion provides financial assistance and support to veterans, including Canadian Armed Forces and RCMP and their families who are in need. Poppy funds may be used for the following purposes. Grants for food, heating costs, clothing, prescription medication, medical appliances and equipment, essential home repairs and emergency shelter, or assistance for veterans and their families in need. Housing accommodation and care facilities for veterans. Funding for veteran transition programs that are directly related to the training, education, and support needs of veterans and their families. Comforts for veterans and their surviving spouses who are hospitalized and in need. Veterans visits, transportation, and day trips. Accessibility modifications to assist veterans with disabilities. Educational bursaries for children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of veterans. Support of local cadet units, veterans drop-in centers and services in communities where veterans would benefit, community medical appliances, medical training, medical research which will assist in the care of veterans and their community. To support the work of the Legion Command and service officers across Canada in assisting and representing veterans. Donations for relief of disasters declared by federal or provincial governments which impact veterans in those communities. Promotion and administering of remembrance activities to ensure Canadians never forget the sacrifices of Canada's veterans. The Poppy Trust Fund fiscal year is from October the 1st through to September 30th. In the Poppy Trust Fund year of 2018-2019, Nova Scotia branches raised after expenses just over $771,000 and dispersed just over $736,000 in direct grants to veterans and their families. Veteran transition programs to bursaries, youth programs that foster remembrance and to hospitals and facilities that care for our veterans. Ms. Ms. Mitchell Vino, sorry. With approval from Nova Scotia and Nunavut Command level, branches may also contribute to a centralized fund. Supported partially by branch poppy trust funds, Nova Scotia and Nunavut Command's centralized benevolent fund provides assistance further to supports extended by branches to veterans and their dependents in need. This includes those who are homeless or at risk of homelessness and those facing food insecurity. In 2019, Nova Scotia Nunavut Command Benevolent Fund extended direct support to 47 veterans who were homeless, at risk of homelessness, or faced food insecurity. From January to September of this year, that number sits at 21. 
Included, too, through that centralized benevolent fund is Nova Scotia Nunavut Command's veteran outreach programs. The program's mission is to provide enrichment to veterans' lives and to assist in the transition to civilian life through connection to recovery-oriented care, programming, social services, and peer support. By fostering and forming mutually supportive partnerships with established community resources, healthcare professionals, all levels of government, and like-minded individuals, the Veterans Outreach Program offers a hand up. Funded partially through Nova Scotia Nunavut Command Legion Branch Poppy Trust Funds, support has been extended through programs such as the Veterans Transition Network, Porchlight, Trauma Relapse Prevention Programs, Pause for Thought, Operational Stress Injury Social Support Peer and Family Programs, Rally Point Retreat, Heroes Mending on the Fly, Mental Health First Aid, the Veteran Farm Project, Operation Vet Bill, and Buddy Check Coffee Groups with full connection to the Royal Canadian Legion's National Operational Stress Injury Special Section. At the provincial command level, Poppy Trust Funds raised support the operation of the Command Veteran Service Bureau, whereby professional command service officers assist veterans and their families by providing information and advice on available Veteran Affairs Canada programs and benefits, assistance with the preparation and submission of disability claims, assistance with the claims process from first application up to and including requests for reconsideration with the Veterans Review and Appeal Board, as well as professional advice and assistance in accessing other programs and benefits. The services provided by the Command Service Bureau are free of charge whether or not the veteran or dependent is a Legion member. Our representation role is mandated through legislation. Command Service Officers also assist and represent still serving Canadian Armed Forces members, RCMP members and their families. On average, Nova Scotia Nunavut Command Service Bureau carries an open file caseload of 400 clients and is the third busiest Legion Command Service Bureau in the country. In 2019, we were responsible for over $13.1 million awarded in financial lump sum for VAC disability claims and 18 new monthly pensions and increases. As important though, to these monetary payouts are the medical benefits given to each individual for the rest of their lives. The Legion is Canada's largest veteran and community service organization. Our membership includes currently serving and retired Canadian Armed Forces and Royal Canadian Mounted Police members, as well as their mothers and fathers, wives and husbands, sons and daughters and grandchildren. Each of these are deeply impacted by the care our veterans receive and the issues affecting them. We also welcome into our membership those without military affiliation who support Canada's veterans. Thank you, Ms. Um, sorry. Ms. Bino, uh, Mitchell Bino, I apologize. And we open it now to questions. I have two on the list. Uh, oh, I Oh, I apologize. Quite finished the oh, presentation. I I'd like now to ask you to call upon my colleague, Don McCumber, to complete I, I the presentation. Thank I should have you. just had a little conversation at the beginning <laughs> to make sure. Um, sorry. Um, Mr. McCumber, sorry. Without Legion volunteers, the tremendous programs and services the Legion provides to our veterans and their families would disappear. In the days leading up to November the 11th, poppies can be seen in every corner of this great country. This show of support and display of remembrance would not be possible without the efforts of thousands of legionnaires who volunteer to distribute poppies to the community through schools, community organizations, and local businesses. 
We are grateful for the support of the many partners, local and national, who welcome Legion volunteers and poppy boxes into their locations. We thank all Canadians for supporting the Legion's poppy campaign and honouring Canada's veterans, lest we forget. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell, are you, do you have any more? Thank you. It's that portion of our Thank you for your opening Thank you. Thank you for your opening remarks. And I apologize for earlier. Um, we will start the questioning at the moment, and I do have two names. Uh, we will start with Ms. Miller from the Liberal Party. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and what a great, this is my first day on this committee, so it's a pleasure to be here again, certainly talking about uh, the poppies and, and uh, veterans. Um, <clears throat> they have a special place in my heart. My parents were Dutch immigrants and uh, lived in occupied Holland. So they firsthand know the sacrifices that Canadians made for them. And it's always been instilled in us and uh, you know, to, to appreciate the veterans and what they've done, you know, for other countries, what they've done for Holland, and certainly is the reason that they even moved to Nova Scotia. So, you know, thank you. Uh, you can please extend my thanks for that. Uh, this year, we actually had the opportunity to go visit uh, some sites in uh, in Europe, in uh, actually in France. We went to uh, Vimy Ridge, saw the memorials there, saw the fields there. It was amazing, and went to the uh, the Canadian Cemetery, where we actually had the time then too to appreciate that sacrifice. I don't think you get the scope of it until you go there and you see all those headstones and you see everything that's going. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. I, I can't say that enough. It just means so much to me. So it's certainly something I always do support. And I've seen a change in the last few years that I've noticed from the time that I used to go to the cemetery as a child, which was many years ago, and, and even to now. It seems to be more and more people are going. You know, the cemetery on Remembrance Day are packed. You know, they're crowded with so many people. You know, do you attribute that to the children are learning more in school? Uh, that they're, you know, what is making that change? And although I celebrate it, sometimes it makes me wonder why that's happening. Is that something you can respond to? I would like to. Ms. Mitchell Vino. Thank you. Um, I don't think we will ever know the reason um, for the increased number of Canadians that we see even worldwide observing remembrance, especially on November 11th. But um, I, I would certainly think that with the access to information that um, you know the human race actually has now, perhaps we've become more aware of the populations on this earth who do not have the right to self-determination. And I think probably as Canadians, um, we, we celebrate and are ever more grateful because we're aware of people in not as fortunate circumstances as we get to live in in this country. Um, and, and so I, I believe that, that perhaps we're more overt in expressing that, especially when it comes to November 11th and remembrance. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Uh, Beno, uh, and you, you have a follow-up, Ms. Miller? Yes. Uh, just a quick oh, one. I'm so I, sorry. Mr. McCumber has a, to add some comments sure. as well. It, it, just as a, a follow-up to your comments, uh, I, I'd like to say that uh, we, we realize that the, the respect that the Dutch people certainly have for our veterans. Uh, however, I'd just like to point out that we certainly appreciate the citizens uh, of the Netherlands and their government for what the people do in the upkeep of our, cem our cemeteries and also the history that is taught in, in the local schools and that government on what's, what had happened in past and the value of our Canadian veterans to those people. So I think we, we, we do offer respect the, the citizens of, of the Netherlands and certainly appreciated all of the tulip bulbs that were, were sent to, to Canada to be planted in memory of our, our fallen comrades. Thank you, Mr. McCumber. Ms. Miller, would you like to do a follow-up? 
Yes, and, and also, you know, on that note about celebrating uh, or remembering, I guess it's not really celebrating Remembrance Day, but certainly, the, you know, remembering Remembrance Day and, and all, the, all our fallen heroes. You know, this year is going to be a little bit different because of, of COVID. And I, well, I expect somebody else will probably ask you about local services, but what about schools? Are they going to be able to, you know, have some of those services that they've had in past years? Mr. McCumber. Uh, I know locally that our our legions have contacted the school and certainly there are strict regulations that they have to follow. What some of the branches are doing is uh, they're submitting packages on, on remembrance and, and uh, hoping that the, the teachers will have their own in-class little services uh, some legions are submitting videos and whatever supportive information they can give to the schools to present to the students. But uh, as you're aware, we will not be able to have, you know, the, the services that we have had in past this year. Thank you, Ms. Miller. And, and Next on the list, I have Ms. Maslin from the PC party. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, COVID-19 has changed so much in, um, in our lives. Uh, and it certainly has had um, a very concerning effect on many of our not-for-profit organizations uh, and our legions. Um, I know that uh, the numbers that you had cited on uh, monies that are collected from the annual poppy campaign uh, and what that resonates to local levels is very significant. Um, what do you anticipate uh, as, or if any, will there be a lost revenue for this year's poppy campaign due to COVID-19 and more people staying uh, more close to home? Who would like to take up? Ms. Mitchell Vino. Thank you. Uh, we, we certainly do expect a drop in, uh, in the generation of funds on a community level. Um, I don't think it necessarily relates to people staying uh, closer to home. Um, I believe that the drop will be realized because businesses don't find themselves in a financial position whereby they can purchase the wreaths and make the donations that uh, they certainly have in the past. Um, I believe that we will still have Nova Scotians making donations to receive poppies. Uh, as Mr. McCumber mentioned, we have many partners in the business community and corporately uh, who are, are accepting our poppy trays and our poppies without those being manned this year. So we're very thankful for that because we're unable, of course, to physically be um, in, in particular settings. Uh, and to maintain the health protocols that are required. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Vino. Um, Ms. Maslin, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Ms. Maslin. Thank you. Uh, I was, uh, was on social media last night and I, I found something that um, our local squadron 545 uh, leader had, had put a plea out to people in the community to make sure they supported our local legion. Um, uh, the Mersey Branch 38, and I was surprised of how much money they actually bring in um, to help local veterans and their families and the cadets and so many more uh, people and things uh, within the community. And um, I know the people that I've spoken to within our branch, they're concerned that that there may be, um, you know, less funds this year because of the pandemic we're in. And I understand that um, at the end of September 30th, that anything that is left over in that poppy fund that is held in trust, 10% of that goes back to the command. Uh, I'm just wondering, in light of 
the fact that we're in a pandemic and many of our legions are really struggling, some I hear may not even make it past December, is there any uh, thought within command um, to, to allow legion branches to keep the remainder of that funds uh, to help people that uh, may be in need this year? Ms. Mitchell Bino. With that question. Uh, the 10 percent assessment that is applied to the balance in the Poppy Trust Fund for each branch at the end of the Poppy Trust Fund year, which is the 30th of September, is actually based on the previous year's campaign. So the assessment that will be levied on the branches on the balance of the Poppy Trust Fund after they have uh, reported and recorded all of the expenses to support the veterans, to support their mission, and all of the initiatives that um, we laid out in our presentation. Whatever that balance is, is what that 10% is based on. So if that branch is utilizing 100% of its funds in support of the mission, then 10% of zero balance is zero. Um, so we won't actually uh, be levying an assessment on this year's campaign until this time next year. So certainly, uh, you know, if the branch is unable to raise sufficient funds to support the veterans in their area, then, then those veterans are supported through my office, through our provincial and territorial command. Our service bureau, uh, and professional service officers provide representation uh, through the Veterans Affairs benefit process um, and, and claims for every veteran uh, through, throughout our command, so within the territory of Nunavut and the province of Nova Scotia. So we require a percentage of the unused balance in the Poppy Trust Funds in order to support the overall mission and to provide support to veterans and their families in branches that can't necessarily financially um, maintain, maintain that support. I hope that answers that question and clears a lot up for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. And we move on right now to the NDP, Ms. Roberts. Thank you, and thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I was struck at, um, at your, de your description of the benevolent fund and um, at my constituency level uh, we, we have a pretty, pretty firm grasp on the benevolent funds that exist at the community level. Um, we've resorted to the Lions Club, we've resorted uh, to the Brunswick Street Mission. Those are of course our funds that are um, accessible for, for all citizens. Um, and uh, I just, I wonder, um, I don't think we've had constituents come to us uh, in need of support who are veterans because obviously, um, or perhaps obviously, uh, they, they have another place to resort to when they, um, you know, are not able to make their rent or are not able to both make their rent and pay their food bill and, and uh, you know, cover their power bill and, and et cetera. Um, but I wonder if you could, could tell me a little bit more about the Benevolent Fund. Is that centrally, um, centrally held and centrally allocated? Or are there, is it, is it uh, you know, done at a regional level by, by different, uh, different regions? And, and how have you seen the demands on it change? Um, maybe both over time, but also during this particular period of the COVID, um, COVID global pandemic. Ms. Mitchell Vino. At the community level, branch poppy trust funds may be utilized for supports such as, um, you know, shelter, um, uh, emergency shelter, uh, transitional shelter, food insecurity, all of the things that Comrade McCumber laid out. So um, individuals who fall within our definition of a veteran and fall within our mandate uh, can approach branches to ask for the type of, si of, of assistance you described. And if they, they fit within our criteria, uh, then they can access funding at that level. But 
um, they can also um, access or seek supports from the centralized uh, benevolent fund. So if I had an individual who lived in New Glasgow who contacted my office and required emergency assistance for that whole range of, of potential supports, um, I would work perhaps in conjunction with the branch, depending on the health of the branch poppy trust fund, and we would work together to find a solution for the veteran. Um, there are situations, though, whereby the local branch Poppy Trust Fund is, is not healthy enough to provide that assistance, in which case 100% of the, the assistance would, would be provided through the Benevolent Fund. How we've seen a change um, considering um, COVID is... is, is um, somewhat difficult to explain because one of the things that happened um, because of the pandemic very early on was that there was freeze on evictions. So that actually helped us um, and, you know, delayed uh, the inevitable, uh, but took a lot of pressure off some of our clients, took a lot of pressure off of our funds because of the lack of transitional housing uh, that we have available, especially within the HRM, um, and, and the lack of affordable housing that we have throughout the province, we end up expending um, huge amounts uh, housing veterans or their dependents and their dependents in hotels until we can seek other avenues to house them comfortably and safely. Um, so COVID-19 in a way helped us um, with some of that. It, it kept people in, in uh, housing that, you know, they were in danger of, of, of um, being evicted from. And of course, you know, the, the supports that the federal government or the, the banks allowed also help those who were were on the cusp of losing their homes. What what more what affects us more are the extreme delays in processing claims and applications through Veterans Affairs Canada. And with the pandemic, the Veterans Affairs Canada were not working at full capacity, and that full capacity has not been enough. So that's more the, the problem um, that was exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, I, I could use all of the day to discuss the delays in Veterans Affairs and um, the drastic ramifications of that. But I hope that's answered your questions. Ms. Roberts, a follow-up. Thank you. Um, I, I find your answer quite interesting, in part because it's challenging my own perception of who your members are. Um, I, I'm the NDP's um, spokesperson on housing, and so I speak about and learn about affordable housing kind of regularly, and I'm talking about it regularly. Um, you know, our party position is that we, we need um, rent control in Nova Scotia because we've been contacted by people even during this pandemic um, who have been served notice of very significant rent increases, um, you know, 10%, 15%, 45%, because we have truly no rent control in Nova Scotia. And, and so there is no limit, especially if a, if a building, a multi-unit building changes hands, all of a sudden every, and every tenant in the building can be served notice with a significant rent increase. Um, but I did not um, anticipate that affordable housing would be um, su such, a, I guess, a, a prominent concern amongst your members. Um, and, and so I wonder if you can just, uh, I guess, speak to me a little bit more uh, about that. We certainly are aware that 
um, affordable housing is not only an issue for very low income Nova Scotians. We're hearing about sort of more middle income Nova Scotians. Um, basically anybody who's a renter is very vulnerable. Um, but but speak, can you speak to me just a little bit more because I'm realizing that I'm having a perception of a, of a veteran which is maybe not, uh, not up to date um, of someone who, who served for some time and has gone on to uh, work but also maybe has more benefits than some of the people that I would um, typically assist through my constituency office. But obviously they are you know, in, in some numbers, and you also mentioned, you know, people with dependents, so that also means quite young people with children, uh, also also vulnerable to, to homelessness. And, and when you speak of transitional housing, transitional from what? Is it transitional from military housing? Or are you talking about transitional from, from some other circumstance? Ms. Mitchell Benno. So thank you for the questions. It's a very broad topic. Um, I would certainly welcome an opportunity to sit with you or your staff and discuss this in great length. Uh, but generally, um, the people that I refer to, our clients, are those who are ill and injured. Uh, so that opens up a whole other uh, umbrella of uh, clients that, or constituents that, that you may not be aware of. Uh, pensions are fixed. Um, ill and injured uh, individuals are being released from, medically released from the military, anywhere from you know 20 to 35 years old to after a full career. So you could be dealing with a 35-year-old that's on a fixed income that is not going to change for the rest of their lives. And they are ill or injured and cannot be otherwise employed. So um, again, this, this is a topic in and of itself. And I would welcome the interest from your office to um, provide you with good information in, in your advocacy in, in, in that area of homelessness or risk of homelessness. Thank you, Ms. Michelle Vino. And we move on right now to the PC party, Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you both for being here this afternoon. As the son of a World War II veteran, uh, this time of year is, I can't even begin to describe how important it is to um, my household for both from when I was growing up and now, of course. And I know my father always looks forward to November 11th and being able to watch the ceremonies um, this year being a bit different, obviously, but looking forward to watching those ceremonies and the events um, on, November, on November 11th on television. You touched on some issues and some information surrounding some questions I have, and I found it quite interesting how in, 19, in 2019 you helped or assisted 47 veterans related to homeless issues, food shortages, what have you, and this year it's down to 22. And you mentioned how the rent freezes, eviction freezes, I'm assuming other COVID-related pro programs uh, also provided some supports, but I'm wondering, do you have any sort of idea of what would those numbers have actually been if it hadn't been for those support programs? Is it, you know, you've helped 22, but how many actually were in need? Or would have been without programs? Ms. Mitchell, they know. So the figure that I quoted, the 21, um, really only covers uh, from January to September of, of this year. Um, Again, the numbers of clients that present to us in urgent uh, or emergent situations um, requiring support from our centralized benevolent fund is more closely related to the delays in processing claims and entitlements with Veterans Affairs Canada. So, um, If Veterans Affairs Canada is not processing in a timely manner, that equates to people that are without income supports, without medical treatment. 
Uh, so they have no other income. Some don't qualify for pensions because they served less than 10 years, but they're injured and medically released from the military. Some uh, only come to us after um, 18 months of still waiting to have claims processed or entitlements processed, and they've already collapsed all their RSPs. They've already run up the line of credit. They've already gone to um, uh, be lenders uh, for loans. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm answering your question, but I'm not sure I'm making it clear that it is directly related to the processing of entitlements and benefits and claims at the federal level under Veterans Affairs Canada. And surely this committee, of all committees within the province of Nova Scotia, is well aware of the concerns um, of, of, of how entitlements and benefits are processed at that level and the complications that arise from that. Thank you, Ms. mitchell -Vino. Mr. Ryan, a follow-up? Um, th thank you very much for that answer. And you did answer it. Very, it's a very tough issue. Um, there's so many nuances to it, and there shouldn't be. Uh, the, I have personal experience related to the backlog and the timelines that it takes dealing with Veterans Affairs. When I heard the news last week, 50, over 50,000 applicants had their claims in some, you know, place being processed, what stage they were in, Lord knows. Uh, that's, you know, I know whether we're in a pandemic, but it's, you know, these veterans have sacrificed so much for our country, and it's, you know, it's really inexcusable that their delays are of that length of time. Um, to that end, and this is maybe another question you may have difficulty actually providing some you know, insight and um, information on, but related to this 50,000 um, backlog. And veterans are so proud. And it, for them to reach out for help is such a difficult thing for them. And I'm wondering, with such a backlog, are you seeing a significant uptake in actual requests for assistance, be it just with the paperwork to actual supports? Ms. Mitchell, we know. So we are the fifth largest command in the country um, of the Royal Canadian Legion, but we are the third busiest service bureau in the country. Um, I have two full-time service officers. Uh, all they do is um, representation and claim work, and we carry a full file caseload of 400 clients on average day in, day out. 12 months out of the year. And um, if, if we could receive additional funding from some source, I could use two more service officers to process claims. Did that answer your question? Was that the question that I answered? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Vino. And we move on now to the uh, Liberal Party, Mr. Jessam. Thank you kindly, Madam Chair. I just uh, I had some question or a question initially related to any type of contingency uh, planning or uh, thoughts that uh, relate to supplementing the the poppy fund itself. I, we can all acknowledge that that's I think one one if not the main fundraiser uh, annually, and I. Regardless of what the scenario is this year, it's related to a global pandemic. Um, surprise, and um, you know it, it could be something else in the future. So I just wonder if uh, your organization has any uh, contingency planning that we mightn't hear about related to supplementary fundraising initiatives for your organization through the chair. Who would like to take this one? Ms. Mitchell Vino. Uh, so, Poppy Trust funds uh, cannot be utilized for branch operations or any use other than as.
as Comrade McCumber outlined. So um, branches, of course, uh, raise funds through um, initiatives such as, you know, uh, community suppers or drive-throughs. They're being extremely creative right now because the usual sources um, of, of funding for them are not possible. Uh, they can't do catering. They can't rent out their facilities safely. Um, so branches, we find, are being extremely creative. We do have um, a source of funding at our command level. Uh, that uh, supports our mission, and that is the Veterans Services Recognition Booklet. And I'm quite sure most of your offices would have been contacted asking for your support of, of, of that publication. We publish that uh, once a year, and it is a collection of biographies, um, um, of, of veterans that are, are submitted by their families or their communities, and um, we do sell advertising in that pop, in that publication, um, and distribute the publication to uh, community libraries, school libraries, um, many of the advertisers, you know, which would be medical practices if they're allowed to actually have books and things that people handle in their waiting rooms, um, and to uh, even the Premier's office. Uh, so that's a significant fundraiser for us at the command level. Um, the mission, the foremost mission of the Royal Canadian Legion is to support, advocate and support for veterans and their families. That is primary, it will be foremost. Uh, we do a, a, a lot of other um, uh, great things in our communities uh, and certainly, you know, everything from youth programs at the provincial level to, um, you know, uh, educational programs and leadership programs for youth. Uh, but the primary mission will be upheld and that's, that's the main thing. So. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Vino. Mr. McCumber. Just to just to add to that, um, when there are special needs that come up for for veterans, there are other avenues for the branches to raise funds. For example, in the Yarmouth area, uh, their van, the veterans needed a van for transportation. It was 17 years old, and uh, so the five legions in the areas in the area embarked on a fundraising project and within a short period of time raised $106,000 to put a new van in that location. And as we speak, there are another nine legions uh, in the South Shore uh, area that are presently raising funds for a new van in Lunenburg. So when needs come up, special needs come up, that uh, perhaps uh, there isn't a need to take it out of a poppy fund, there are special projects and, and fundraisers that they can take on to accommodate the needs of, of veterans as well. Thank you, Thank you Mr. McCumber. Uh, Mr. Jessam, a follow-up? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll have to double-check to make sure that we're participating in that uh, recognition booklet that was referenced. Thank you for that. Um, uh, reference to, to, to youth here, uh, that was kind of a good segue to my next question. So uh, evidently the cadets are kind of a, uh, a for, for me anyway, the, the first, uh, first thought that comes to mind with respect to participation of young people in uh, honoring our veterans in, uh, you know, supporting uh, that space, military um, veterans, whatever, what, what have you. Uh, I'm just wondering if your organization has any sort of initiatives specific to recruiting the next generation uh, to support the Legion specifically? Through the chair, Mr. McCumber. 
I would just like to say that, that we do, we, we certainly recognize and appreciate the value of our cadets that assist us in, in many ways in the Legion, not just during remembrance. Um, and in recognizing that, uh, we do offer uh, the cadets, when they um, age out, a, a one-year membership to the Royal Canadian Legion, encouraging them to continue on um, above their program and working in the community, you know, through the Legion. Thank you, Mr. McCumber. Would you like to add something to that, Ms. Uh, no? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jessam. And next is uh, Ms. Roberts from the NDP party. Thank you. Um, uh, I normally celebrate um, or mark uh, Remembrance Day at Northwood um, in my constituency. There isn't a cenotaph in Halifax Needham, so I've been invited since I was elected to, to mark that day at Northwood. Um, and, and I have to say, I have never entirely understood why certain uh, veterans are there in long-term care it, it, versus at Camp Hill, but it may be a case where uh, they moved to Northwood to be with um, with a spouse who wasn't eligible at Camp Hill, or, or it, I know in some cases um, they also have some veterans who are actually veterans of uh, the U.S. military um, and and other other um, uh, service experiences. Um, Mr. McCumber, I believe that you mentioned. Uh, some assistance that is given to seniors in, in long-term care. I wonder if you could, uh, from the, from the Poppy, Poppy Fund proceeds, I wonder if you could just share a little bit more about um, your intersections and uh, perspective on, on the experience of uh, members um, in long-term care. Mr. McCumber. Um, yes, it, it, it's a topic that... that uh, of concern to me with regards to the whole long-term care issue, and that is that um, in Veterans Affairs, as we know, uh, look after and contract, simply contract out the beds in these long-term care facilities. The criteria, as I understand it, is that you know if uh, a veteran has served overseas and has seen active duty then they qualify for one of those uh, bets for long-term care. So, for example, again, using Yarmouth as an example, if we, there are 15 beds. If uh, beds come available, then there are veterans that could be upstairs in hospital beds that don't qualify for that accommodation. So Veterans Affairs is basically saying we'll contract out the beds, but the health authorities seem to have a lot of power in the decision making. And uh, there really, as I see it, a need for policy changes to ensure that these facilities remain open to our veterans, our modern day veterans, or those coming along, because as we know, we have, we're losing our veterans, and so that's something that hopefully you can keep in the back of your mind in, in encouraging the criteria to change. And uh, and we we certainly do offer you know programs to to our seniors in the in the community by providing the facilities. You know, uh, I mean now we're faced with COVID, but. You know, we have in past provided that as a, a as a community center, the legion for our seniors to to take part in, and uh, we're certainly there to help them as well in any ways that we can. Yeah. Ms. Mitchell, you know, would you like to ask? Uh, thank you. Um, so, if, for instance, the branch in Liverpool, Nova Scotia. Uh, wanted to um, support veterans that are their veterans from their communities that are in long-term care facilities. Um, 
they would go to the long-term care facility and ask if there was any supports that could be provided to make the, you know, the, com the comfort paramount um, of those veterans in that facility. So they would then, uh, the branch would then make application to be able to utilize uh, however much the fund is requested. And in this case, in this term, Comrade McCumber would make the decision uh, that the branch could actually expend those funds and it would be an acceptable use of Poppy Trust funds. Um, so that's that's a way too that veterans are supported in long-term care facilities. If an individual veteran needed comforts um, that they were unable to provide for themselves, uh, then too they the facility normally would contact the branch, and uh, you know a certain amount of those comforts or certain ones of those comforts comforts wouldn't require Comrade McCumber's approval. Um, such as blankets or, you know, pieces of clothing or that, that type of support. So that's offered too through the Poppy Trust Funds. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Vino, and uh, a follow-up for Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, just to, to follow up with, um, uh, with Mr. McCumber, uh, as I understand your concern around long-term care and around the wait uh, for long-term care, uh, do you understand the, um, the challenge to be uh, the management of the waiting list and that, and that veterans uh, should be prioritized to enter when a bed becomes available? Or is, is the challenge uh, a shortage of beds, which, you know, as I understand it, um, you know, uh, in Nova Scotia, we haven't we haven't opened an, a new long-term care bed um, in a, in a long time. There's been some announced recently, um, but as I understand it, right now, in for uh, a, you know a general client of continuing care, one doesn't get access to long-term care until one really, really, really needs 24-hour nursing care, and that you know sort of managing with. Um, with really a scarcity of resources has resulted in, in many people waiting in hospital. Um, so again, my, just to reiterate my question, is, is the challenge the, the policy of the management of, of the waiting list or, or do you see the challenge as being the, the lack of resource which is effectively needs to be shared um, between veterans and, and other um, older Nova Scotians in, and not even necessarily older Nova Scotians, but other Nova Scotians in need of long-term care? Take this question, Mr. McCumber. Uh, yes, um, I, I can't relate provincially as to to what's happening. I'm, I'm speaking mainly from my own local area, from what I what I've seen, and uh, there seems to be, you know, sufficient beds in, in my local area to accommodate the veterans. I guess my, my concern is that as the veterans that qualify decrease and more beds become available, that these beds should be available to veterans that perhaps have not seen overseas or active duty, that there could be, we have veterans that served in this country that did not go overseas, that are veterans, that made contributions. And what some are concerned about is that as the numbers decrease, that Veterans Affairs will get out of, out of the, the long-term care and turn it simply over to the Nova Scotia uh, Housing Authority or, or to um, the Health Authority and that our veterans will fall by the wayside. And so my comment is that I, I hope and trust that policy and the criteria will change for the veteran units in Lunenburg or in Yarmouth that will continue to allow veterans to, to use those beds and, and, and be accommodated in the future as opposed to everything being turned over to 
a health authority. Thank you, Mr. And that issue was discussed with uh, the Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs at a, uh, a recent uh, town hall meeting uh, in Yarmouth. So we, we certainly let our voices be known. Yes. Thank you, Mr. McCumber. Are you? And maybe we, this is a perfect time to take our 15 minutes break. We will be back at 3.15. And we exit from the back doors, please.
Order. Order. We will continue our questions. And we will be starting with Ms. Chender from the NDP party. Thank you, uh, and thank you for all of your, all the information that you're offering us today. We really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> you spoke a little bit about the legions on the ground, sort of separate from specifically the Poppy campaign. And, and one of the questions I have um, is, I know that one of the big issues, I guess kind of jumping off of my colleague's point, uh, that we've seen in the pandemic has been social isolation. And so particularly for seniors, and we know not all um, veterans are seniors, but certainly there are many. <laughs> and so I know, you know, in, in our local branches, for instance, at least for a long time, there wasn't bingo, there weren't the, you know, gathering opportunities. And so I wonder if you can speak to kind of what, if anything, is happening around um, meeting folks' needs for community and connection in a, in a different way, if there's work being done either at the local level or, or centrally. Mr. Cumber. Well, I'd just like to say that we've had to come up with some innovation, innovative ideas, but we have, I know in, in my area, in local area, that, and, and others, that um, we realize that veterans, you know, can't get out to the functions that they, they certainly used to. So we've made an attempt to, to go to them and uh, have had the opportunity to go to Veterans Place with uh, an individual that was celebrating a 100th birthday. And we gathered outside, keeping our distance, of course, and uh, saying happy birthday you know, to him, which he was very pleased to see us there. And uh, saying happy birthday to him, we've, we've had vet, uh, a, a, a lady veteran who family brought her outside and uh, we in our vehicles drove by and blew the horn and wished her, you know, wishing her a, a happy birthday. Um, and, and also we're looking, at, I know again, and I can only speak from, from my area, that if, if there doesn't happen to be some type of a service, remembrance service in the community, that uh, an attempt will be made to go to the facilities and again, perhaps have one outside while they can watch from inside and try to make them feel part of, of the remembrance. So. You know, there's uh, been an, uh, occasions where the, the communities have jumped in with, with antique, uh, an antique car parade, you know, to drive by the facilities. So we have to look now more of going to them and trying to put on some events for them to at least make the veterans know that we're still out there for them and uh, looking after them. Ms. Mitchell-Vino as well would like to add something. Thank you. So, um, you know, provincially and territorially speaking, because we also represent the territory of uh, Nunavut, branches um, have, from the very beginning of the pan pandemic, taken extra efforts to contact the veterans, have conversations with them on a daily basis, form telephone trees, deliver groceries, um, um, pick up medications, deliver medications, whatever supports are required. Uh, not just to veterans, but uh, you know, fellow members as well. Thank you, Ms. Vino. Uh, and for, um, Ms. Chender for a follow-up, sorry. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, I heard you speak a little earlier about the fundraising for the van in Yarmouth. And, you know, I recognize that I'm sure people are continuing to step up and show up for their branches and, and for veterans uh, through this challenging time. But along with the cancellation of so many of those events, and obviously the bar is closed and, you know, the building has been closed, are there overhead challenges, because I heard you say that that Poppy Benevolent campaign, you know, that those proceeds are not to be used for overhead. Um, have you been hearing of challenges at the local branch level in terms of overhead? And um, can you say anything about that? Ms. Mitchell, 
Uh, Vino, please. Thank you. Um, so just for the record, the majority of the branches, Legion branches within Nova Scotia and Nova Command are opened. Um, they are uh, operating at reduced uh, hours uh, and, you know, uh, reduction in the number of events and the types of events. Um, but they are there. And even if and when the buildings were closed, um, the the mission was maintained to serve veterans um, and their families. Absolutely, there are operational challenges. Uh, the the closure um, due to the requirements as established by public health. Uh, actually, if, if there could have been a good time weather-wise to close our branches. That was probably a good time in March and leading into the spring and the summer when our operational expenses um, at the local level are less. There's great concern uh, with uh, challenges to meet the utility bills uh, with the coming colder weather in buildings that um, are slowly being upgraded but not fully. Um, so. There are certainly challenges to um, operational budgets coming um, in the next few months. Branches have been able to utilize some of the government programs, including um, the programs extended by the Nova Scotia government, which have been extremely helpful. Uh, the Legion Capital Assistance Program continues to be a mainstay in this province in uh, supporting our branches to upgrade their buildings by doing things like inserting um, heat pumps and new windows and insulation, um, which all go toward, of course, reducing our operational expenses. So the answer to that question is absolutely will we be facing challenging times? Um, that is true, we will. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Vino. And uh, uh, our next uh, question is with um, the Liberal Party, Minister Ince. Uh, first of all, thank you both for serving. Um, the question I have is more immediate, and it's around um, your, your volunteers and the folks who are usually out helping with the poppy campaigns. And I understand from talking to a couple of uh, the branches that there are challenges. Some places aren't, don't want you inside and so on. What can we do as uh, politicians to try to help you in that area? Because it's important. Um, I've already volunteered to go out and help out, so I don't know. What can we do? Ms. Mitchell Vino. Well, thank you for volunteering. Uh, I would certainly encourage um, all Nova Scotians to volunteer where they can to um, help make the Poppy Campaign a success. Um, each of you has access to large groups of people. You have access to media. Um, you have public exposure. Please encourage Nova Scotians to support the Poppy Campaign this year. Um, it is solely the Poppy Campaign funds that are raised that support uh, veterans and their families. Um, and uh, without that, the supports we're able to provide as a volunteer, not-for-profit charitable organization, uh, will be greatly reduced. Is the province of Nova Scotia or the government of Canada ready and able to step in and do what we do? Um, so please speak about it. En encourage others to support it at every opportunity. And every time I see you, publicly or in the media, and you've done that, I will be thanking you. 
Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Bino. And um, before your uh, follow-up, Minister, may I ask just a quick one? Are we able to, for example, my office is in a cafe, in a um, market and cafe. Are you able to deliver so that we can maybe go around and sell it as in our offices? Would that be a possibility? Okay. Well. Sorry, Ms. Mitchell Veno, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, absolutely, I will leave you my card so you can contact my office and I will have my staff look after that. But just as a, as a clarification, we do not sell poppies, we distribute poppies right. and accept donations. Correct. Thank you. I, I, no, I, I do uh, thank you thank for you. correcting that. Um, Minister Inns, for the follow-up, please. I don't have a follow-up, thank you. I'm just more concerned about the immediate and how we can, you know, help support that particular campaign. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Minister, Minister Inns. And the next person that we have is from the PC party, Ms. Maslin. Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question, again, talking about the challenging times that many of our branches um, uh, will be experiencing. You've alluded to, you know, the ability to meet the utility bills and the winter months that are that are coming, uh, and um, sadly, the the lack of being able to um, fundraise uh, as much as they would because of, of the pandemic. Uh, my question is. Uh, you, you mentioned that government, uh, that especially the provincial government, has been able to help, that the Legion branches have been able to access some of those funds. Um, is there an ask that you would have, um, or is there more that you believe that um, government provincially could be doing to, uh, to help with our, our branches? Ms. Mitchell Vino. Uh, thank you. Um, of tremendous benefit to branches within the province of Nova Scotia would be an expansion of the Legion Capital Assistance Program. Um, certainly, Nova Scotia and Nova Command would welcome the opportunity for productive conversation and consultation to that end. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Vino, and Madam um, Ms. Maslin for a follow-up. Thank you. Uh, my final question is: I'm wondering if you could just explain um, a bit about the digital poppy campaign. Um, sadly, I. I shouldn't even admit this, but I didn't know that there was a digital poppy campaign. Um, I guess I spend all my time making sure that I'm at the, you know volunteering with legions or being at services, and I wasn't aware of a digital uh, poppy campaign. So if you could explain just a little bit about that, I'd really appreciate it. Ms. Mitchell Vino. Thank you. So the digital poppy campaign was actually launched last year, and um, it was launched and is maintained by the national level of our organization. In its first year, funds raised through the digital, digital poppy um, campaign were distributed to branches based on the postal code. Um, it, it, it proved to be not the best system, um, especially when you consider in places like Cape Breton where we have three branches that are within five kilometers of each other. Um, so uh, not the best beginning. Um, the digital, digital poppy campaign now uh, raises funds that are appropriate, uh, appropriated to the Legion Foundation, the Legion National Foundation. So um, it is uh, an initiative that uh, is controlled by the national level of the organization. Mm -hmm. Mr. McCumber. If I may, just to, to go back to your, your first question, uh, we have seen uh, throughout the province some municipalities that have come forward and made donations to the legions to help support them. So 
for you individuals that represent you know, many of the communities in your area uh, would ask that you encourage those municipalities to make a contribution to the local legion that provides the service that they do to the veterans in their community and the projects that they run in support of their community members. Thank you, Mr. McCumber. Uh, and our next person is um, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I want to take it back to talking about more about you know the Poppy campaign. I think that's what the subject matter of the day was, and the legions and uh, you know their role in that. So I want to. I'm just wanted to ask. Uh, do you think this is an opportunity to use our virtual world to live stream uh, some of the Remembrance Day ceremonies? And just I, I I'm concerned that people aren't. I know that they're not going to forget, but I mean, just as a reminder, so that this little semblance of normality of remembering on, on Remembrance Day to make sure that they take that time in their personal lives to honor the veterans and their great sacrifices. Ms. Mitchell, you know. I'm terribly sorry, I, I didn't understand a question in that. Ms. Miller. Yeah, the question is more, well, obviously the concern about that, but is there going to be, or is there possible that something virtual could go out so that, you know, it could be, uh, whether it goes out to the schools or whether it goes out to the legions or whatever, that they can put out videos so that people can, can share their, uh, share the services that way. Uh, absolutely, there are plans. Uh, oh, excuse me. No, no, Miss Mitchell. The no. There are plans uh, through local branches to do Facebook Live um, uh, broadcasts of services. Um, the 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 command um, actually is responsible for the remembrance ceremony at Grand Parade, and although it's not been absolutely confirmed yet, it is in, it is uh, hoped that that will be live streamed as well. Thank you. Ms. Um, Miller, do you have a follow-up or that's yes, I do. Thank you. Yeah, and could part of that also be, I know, you know, you're all part of being, you know, planning on what's going to happen and how it is, to remind people that they can always go to their local cemetaphs on their own during those days, you know, during that day, you know, whether it's to leave their own wreath, even though if it's not a ceremony available that day, or to leave their own poppies that day as a memorial, could uh, that be part of that? Ms. Mitchell, they know. Sorry. Press release will be forthcoming from the president of Nova Scotia Nunavut Command on this. Poppy campaign doesn't begin until the 30th of October, so we're really just in in the um, the beginning of the uh, the program for this year, and still working with many moving parts. But thank you very much for that suggestion, and I will pass that along to her. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. And we move on to the NDP, Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Mitchell, we know you, um, earlier you made reference to uh, your charitable status, you know, you're a nonprofit organization, lots of volunteers. Um, there are many organizations uh, in that situation in Nova Scotia that are dealing with, you know, the impacts of, of COVID. Um, but of course, you're a, little, a somewhat unusual organization as well because of your in, your your ties with the military and and so forth, um, and and likewise, uh, you know the, the legions themselves. They are restaurants and bars that are like many other restaurants and bars, but they're also a little bit different because of because of the fact that they're legions. So all of that is a preamble to say. Um, you know, there have been various programs made available for impacted sectors uh, uh, during the pandemic, and I'm wondering to what extent you have been able to uh, to access some of those uh, funding programs, be they federal or provincial, um, and and to what extent you've kind of fallen into into gaps. Ms. Mitchell, Vino, please. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, just to point out that Royal Canadian Legion branches are, are 
definitely um, definitely have a social side to them in that we do have bars and clubhouses um, and uh, we meet our comrades there and we gather there for peer support but we are very much the cornerstone of many communities uh, within this province uh, where everything from uh, a place where um, you hold your grandma's 95th birthday to uh, a warming center when uh, you know there's there's no power in communities so we certainly have a wide range of service um, to our communities we our branches were able to access the Nova Scotia small business grant um, that was made available um, and uh, most did access that funding um, but we didn't qualify for the majority of the funding programs that were offered by the federal government to the not-for-profit and charitable sector um, some branches qualified for the CERB uh, at the federal level, um, although that's a loan program, uh, which is concerning. Um, the federal government just announced uh, $20 million in funding to veteran organizations uh, within the country, um, of which there are many. Uh, there are only two, though, that basically have, uh, you know, bricks and mortar, uh, the Royal Canadian Legion and a far distance, the Army-Navy Association. Um, the funding is apparently for operational expenses, but we have absolutely no details. Um, we, so we have no idea of, of the criteria as it relates to individual branches. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell Vino. And Ms. Roberts, do you have a follow-up? Quick one. Uh, thank you. Um, so my follow-up is, is a bit of a, um, a change. It's the other kind of last question in my mind. So it's not, it's not related to my first question, but I thank you very much for that answer. It's, it's interesting to hear to what extent you've been able to access funds um, that have been made available through, through both levels of government. Um, back to the poppy fund in nursing home, um, and not nursing home, long-term care. Um, and you, you referenced earlier how, you know, if a, if a veteran is in a long-term care facility and is missing some comfort, um, uh, you would be able to access poppy funds in order to provide that. Um, at, at Northwood, there's a, a similar fund which they, they fundraise for in the community, um, such, such that if a, a nursing home resident, you know, is missing something, is not able to provide something, um, they're, they're able to, to um, meet that gap. Um, I wonder if you encounter any challenges because sometimes the you know, sometimes the gaps that I hear about in the long-term care sector is 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 funding kind of more at a systemic level, uh, such that pe you know people aren't able to eat the kind of food that they like because the the, the facility doesn't have the budget, um, the food budget to provide um, the sort of uh, you know food that residents would uh, would prefer to eat, perhaps. Um, and it must be difficult uh, at the level of a nursing home administration to provide you know, an upgrade in service to certain residents because they are veterans when, when there isn't the funding to provide it to all. So I'm wondering if that is a challenge um, that you've encountered. Ms. Mitchell Vino. It's certainly a challenge to say no to anyone in need, um, however they define that need. Um, more specifically though, for supports um, such as uh, medical appliances or medical equipment um, or medications or shelter or even assistance with providing food, all requires an application process that is handled directly by me at our office in consultation with uh, a member of my elected executive council. Um, that application process includes a financial means evaluation of all income, all expenses, all debt commitments. 
Um, if it, if it came to something such as uh, an individual in a um, long-term care facility requiring um, uh, dietary uh, variances than what is offered by the um, facility, we would more likely take the route, if it's a veteran, of advocating for supports for that veteran that meets their needs um, because they would be entitled to that. If it is simply a, a dislike, well, I'm sure one of our branches could make sure that they delivered a fruit basket or chocolate to, um, you know, provide them with a treat every once in a while. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Vino, and we have two more names. Maybe we can... Uh, Cut it down to just one question without a follow-up uh, so that we can give them time, give our witnesses time to give us a, a, a closing remarks as well. Uh, we have next on the list is the PC party, Mr. Ryan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, related to the digital poppy, and you spoke of the challenges after last year and how it's been become more of a national program as opposed to a local program. So that being said, you know, over these past months since March, when our world literally was turned upside down, um, we've seen the creativity and ingenuity of all of us um, front and center. Um, Facebook, social media being used in ways that wasn't really imagined previously. Um, Zoom has become a word that we all know all too well. So I'm wondering what sort of creativity and ingenuity have you seen from the Legion side of the perspective locally and you know, in our region, in our province, with regards to selling the poppy, with regards to the rem remembrance program? And if we could you know, know some of you know, this ingenuity and this creativity so that we can share that information to um, veterans and legions in our own areas where they might not be aware of what they're doing in Dartmouth or in Amherst, and it might be a benefit and it might work in our areas. Ms. Mitchell Vino. Thank you very much. If any of the branches within your communities would like to discuss that, they need only contact my office. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Um, next, uh, Mr. McGuire. Thank you. I'm just kind of sitting here taking this all in. Um, one, uh, one thing I will commit to is, and I think all of us probably could or should, is uh, making a donation uh, to pick up some uh, poppies and contribute the, or distribute them out in our communities. So I'll be contacting uh, somebody within the organization. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm lucky I have uh, a very, um, how would I describe? <laughs> I've got to be careful here. Uh, a very vocal veteran uh, advocate in Gus Cameron in my community. I don't know if you know Gus, but Gus and I have been friends. We go way back. Um, and, and I started uh, shortly after I, I got elected. Um, Gus encouraged me to start coming down to Camp Hill. And, and so I would bring my children down to Camp Hill and, uh, for Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day and, and other things. And um, the... the um, it's, it's heartwarming to see the look on the veteran's face when they see little kids running in the room. And so we, we would talk to them and ask them questions and get to know some of their stories. And obviously some, some are willing to share more than others. One of the things that's always kind of worried me, and my first interaction with a veteran ever was uh, when I was 15 years old working at a restaurant here in Halifax. The owner of the restaurant, um, who's long since passed, was a veteran. Um, I think he was actually a veteran of World War One, so it had been about 30 years ago. Does that sound about right? Uh, he was pretty old at the time. <laughs> uh, so we, I used to cook, and he'd come in and he'd share these stories with me. And I've always worried that uh, these stories, when our veterans pass, especially the, around the Great Wars, uh, that they disappear. And it's 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 good to have you know documentaries and Netflix and all that stuff. What can we do or what is being done to assure that these firsthand stories, I mean, it, I just, I remember there was, and I think the gentleman passed away a couple years ago. It was for uh, Valentine's Day and we'd made up all these Valentines for the veterans. And, and there's one gentleman was talking about how he was a teacher and then shortly after the war, he was jumping out of a plane um, 
behind enemy lines, and he said, I never, ever would have thought. Like, you know, it just wasn't in me. Uh, but of course it was. So um, what can we do to make sure that those stories can carry on, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, like, you know, my children are seven, five, and four, and this was the first time they'd ever heard those stories. So what can we do as MLAs and what can we do as government and, and as a society? Mr. McCumber. Uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, we have um, the Book of Remembrance. And uh, if uh, you can encourage individuals to carry on workshops, uh, say at their local libraries, which has been done, it's amazing the number of individuals that are so proud to come out with pictures of their family and write-ups about what they did. And I think it's uh, certainly one way to record those stories and the history and the events that many of them have been through in their contributions to society, to Canada. And so I certainly encourage, you know, to the promotion of that particular book, Book of Remembrance for Veterans. Ms. Mitchell Vanille. Thank you. Um, other than, um, you know, in unprecedented times as we find ourselves um, this year, we do have uh, an extensive uh, speaker in the schools program um, that's carried out in just about every community in this province. And um, we have veterans uh, and liege members that go into the schools and talk about, you know, personal um, experiences and the importance of remembrance. Poppy trust funds can also be utilized um, to purchase um, uh, presentation materials um, that can be accessed uh, by teachers. They're provided to the schools and, and um, you know, the teachers can access. It's all visual. Um, and uh, there's also uh, an organization called Veterans Voices of Canada that record personal stories. Um, and uh, Veterans Affairs Canada Remembers Division also has a tremendous amount of material and packages that they put together and make available to the schools um, around this time each year. So the, the resources are certainly out there. I guess it's knowing where to find them. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. You know, um, I do not have anybody else on the list. Oh, one last question. I think we have time. Mr. Jessam. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to request that uh, I, I reached out to staff while we were um, speaking here today, just uh, a, perhaps a, a, an additional request for that memo or that request for advertising for the uh, for the recognition booklet I just want to make I, I don't ever remember yeah, me too. seeing it and I want to make sure we're on top of that so if uh, that could be facilitated through you uh, madam chair sure. actually it'd be wonderful sorry it'd be wonderful it could be sent to all MLAs or if you send it to the committee probably the best way and then it will be sent to all of us we would appreciate it and the timing would be perfect. Well, thank you so much. Maybe we, uh, it's a good time to do closing remarks from our witnesses. Mr. McCumber. Well, I just would like to say uh, thank you, you know, for the opportunity to be here today to, to talk about the Remembrance Poppy uh, campaign and what we as Legionnaires are doing to assist our veterans. As we all know, you know, they did so much for us, gave the supreme sacrifice, and we do remember them at this time, but I think it's very important too to remember them every day of the year, not just during remembrance. We should never forget the, the contribution that, that they've made for our, our sake, our, our democracy. So I, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. 
and uh, look for your support, continued support, you know, down, down the road in assisting us and our veterans. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Ms. Mitchell Vino. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to appear once again um, to this committee. Thank you very much for your well thought out questions and for your support. Thank you for your work in support of veterans and their families um, as representatives of the people of Nova Scotia and as members of this committee. As the daughter of a veteran, the sister of a veteran, and the mother of a veteran, I thank you. Thank you on behalf of the committee, and you've really f informed us with a lot of things, and please forward, the timing is perfect. We would love to do more for the veterans because of COVID. Thank you again, and if you could uh, be dismissed from the back, and we will do some bus committee business after this. Thank you. We, we do have some committee business. Uh, we have correspondence that I will read a couple of them for now. Um, November 14, 2019, a letter from the Department of Health and Wellness, a response to October 2, 2019, a letter from the committee after discussion, which happened in September 17th meeting. It was received in the Legislative Committee office on February 28, 2020. After the original response, uh, the, the original response was lost. Uh, includes also January 27, 2020, reminder to the Department of Health and Wellness, and February, 2020, uh, February 20th, 2020, a letter from the committee member, Murray Ryan, the MLA, inquiring as to the status of the correspondence. This was forwarded to the committee members on February 28, 2020, and again yesterday. I did receive it. I hope everybody else received it. Is there any discussion? Everybody's happy? Thank you. February 21st, 2020, a letter from the Department of National Defense, the National Cadet and Junior Canadian Rangers Support Group, response to um, request, from, uh, request for information made at the December 17, 2019 meeting. This was forwarded to the committee members on March 10, 2020, and again yesterday. Did everyone receive it? And is there a discussion? Thank you, everyone. Uh, March 11, 2020, letter from the commissioners, Nova Scotia, a response to request for information made at the February 18, 2020 meeting. This correspondence was also forwarded to committee members on March 12, 2020, and again yesterday. I have received it. Is, is there any discussion? I see no request. Uh, the next one, there was also correspondence on June 16, 2020, a letter from committee members Kim Masland, the MLA, and Marie Ryan, MLA, asked chair to resume meetings. This was forwarded to members on June 18, 2020, and again yesterday. Is there any discussion? I see none. I move on to the next one. June 25, 2020, letter from committee members Kim Maslin, MLA, and Marie Ryan, MLA, uh, asked chair to call a meeting to discuss the future of legions in the wake of COVID-19. This was forwarded to members on June 25th, 2020, and again yesterday. I assume everybody received it, and is there any discussion? I see none. The next thing on our business is the next meeting, which will be Tuesday, November 17, 2 p.m. 
two, uh, at 2 p.m., 2 to 4, Department of Community, Culture and Heritage. And the subject will be Legal Capital Assistance Program. If the House is sitting at that time, the meeting will be cancelled and rescheduled. Is, there, is that okay with everyone? Is there any discussion? Thank you. Uh, I will call the meeting adjourned, unless... Ms. Sure. Sure. Maslin has a motion to make. Um, Madam Chair, today we heard uh, that uh, branches um, uh, are struggling with their fundraising goals uh, because of uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. Um, you know, we heard from our presenters that legions are our community hubs and our communities, that they are the warming stations in some of our communities and they're places where fellow veterans meet. Uh, and where we come to celebrate citizens in our community. And sadly, because of public health protocols, um, many were, re well, they were required to shut their doors for a time and fundraising um, operations ceased. Um, we heard today that many will struggle to pay the utility bills. And if we're struggling to pay the utility bills, I would assume that would be struggled to keep the doors open. Um, because of that, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the committee write to the Premier, as he is the Minister responsible for military relations, asking him to extend a one-time grant to the Legion to support the vital work that they do for our veterans. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any discussion? Mr. Jessam. You just take, take five here, please. Sure. We will take five minutes. We'll be back at 4.01.
We will take another five minutes just to have the uh, motion in writing. Uh, we will be back at 4.06. Thank you. I, uh, we will resume, and I will ask Ms. Maslin just to repeat the motion exactly as she uh, wrote it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today we have heard that our legions will struggle to meet their fundraising goals due to COVID-19. Because of that, I move that the committee write to the Premier as he is the Minister responsible for military relations, asking him to extend a one-time grant to the legions to support their vital work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Maslin. Any discussion? Mr. Jessam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just promptly, I'll uh, uh, bring the support on behalf of the Liberal Caucus uh, for this motion. Thank you, Mr. Jessam. All, all in um, agreed? Oh, say yeah. Nay, um, yes? Yes. yes? Thank you. All in favor, say. Right? Please say yes. Sorry about that. Thank you. All right, so we're done. The only other discussion we should, just in case on November 17, the House is um, sitting, the next meeting would be December 5th, Tuesday, December 15. Is that okay with everyone? Thank you again, and meeting adjourned. Thank you.